So first and foremost, Matt, hello, and thank you for joining us. Why don't you begin by telling our audience a little bit about your professional background and what you're going to be presenting on today? Sure. Hi, David. Good to, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Matt Ruth. Uh, I'm the president of Avancion. Uh, Avancion is the controls and information systems integration company. We've been around for 40 years, really focusing on digital transformation and the, uh, the challenges that our manufacturing customers have to take technology in the control space and operational technology space and apply it in their facilities. And so we're here today to talk a little bit about how the use of common IT tools can be applied uh, in the realms of data analytics and machine learning to get some operational benefit from manufacturing. So I'm really excited to share a little bit about this, this topic. It's, it's something that um, you're gonna see more and more in the uh, OT space. And so I think it's very, very relevant at this time. Fantastic, and it sounds like something that's definitely going to be relevant to our audience. So let's go ahead, and I think you have some materials prepared, but let's go ahead and start with our first question, uh, which is very simply, uh, what is data analytics? How does it work? And what are some real world examples of it? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, so data analytics and machine learning, uh, here's some of the questions that we were, were gonna discuss today. Um, we, we have we have uh, a number of these uh, that we're going to walk through, and, and, and as David, you mentioned there, we're going to touch on the first one of how it works and what it is. Um, really, this comes down to using and managing data, and so analytics for OT is very similar to, to the approach analytics for IT. It's how do you take these reams and reams of data and apply them in the OT space? Um, but I think it's important to share a little bit about what data science is. Um, and, and data science is really kind of focused on taking a specific goal, a specific business problem, a specific operational challenge, and using data to explore the opportunity and the possibilities and the likely outcomes on how to improve that business process. And so it involves getting information, it involves exploring that data and cleaning it up and making sure that, it, that it's ready for consumption, modeling it and then taking it and applying analytics tools against it. Um, and so there's tons and tons of examples of how this works in the world today. Um, it, it's uh, everybody, it's, nobody has to go any further than their smartphone in their pocket uh, to, to be reminded on how data is influencing your life every day. So everything from the way that you do your, your banking and your credit cards, uh, that you're, if you're standing at a gas pump in some unknown state that you're not supposed to be in and you process your credit card and let you know that you did and make, make sure that it's not fraud uh, all the way through <clears throat> all the way through the, the personal assistant you may have uh, that's that's predicting where you should be and when you should arrive at a certain location be it work or home or whatnot so it's it's everywhere in our lives um, the opportunity is, is obviously to apply this to OT but at the core of it, it's always this process of asking a really interesting question. So in the case of um, uh, flight delays, um, it's which flights might be delayed and, and how, how do you minimize it? So that's the question people pose. Um, it goes out and gathers data. Uh, analytics applications will gather data from various different points and contextualize them against each other. So go pick the weather, the maintenance schedules, and, and what Southwest performance on flights has historically been, which isn't that great lately, but uh, it's, it's coming along. But anyway, get that information and then be able to look for correlations, understand how that relates to each other. And then from that, model it and predict an outcome from that data. And so trying to understand the probability, likelihood, or the, the viability of your flight being on time or not. So we use that kind of thing every day and we've taken that for granted. So now the opportunity is, is where can you apply that in OT? And so there's a couple of different ways to take a look at that. Um, and for us, it's, it's applying the, the, the various forms and models of analytics. And, and the first one is descriptive analytics. And I think everybody in manufacturing has some form of descriptive analytics, be it uh, the, be it the whiteboard that you write on at the end of the day, kind of to set up your, your um, uh, to communicate your productivity that's descriptive of what happened. It can be on the TV screen then too, as to what, what KPIs you've achieved. Um, a lot of folks have diagnostic analytics. And so trying to figure out why something failed 
because it reached the end of its life cycle, there's all, the, all of a sudden an abrupt failure and you're trying to figure out why that occurred. The next level that, that folks don't necessarily apply as much is predictive. And so being able to understand when will it happen again, taking and identifying the probability of that failure. And then the third form of anal a fourth form of analytics, excuse me, is prescriptive. And so what should we do based on what's happened in the past? How can I uh, predict what I should do and make a recommendation on how we should operate? Um, and so that's replacing the component before its failure. So this thing on the right-hand side of the uh, manufacturing component failing at, at a critical time, identifying the probability is what a lot of people refer to as a, a computerized maintenance management system and trying to predict how to uh, maintain a system inside of the facilities. So that's a common use in manufacturing for some maybe some more advanced and evolved manufacturers, but that's a good example. I'm gonna give you and share a little bit more on um, other places that you can use this. Sure, and before we, we move on any further, I do wanna ask two brief follow-up questions. Um, one on your first, what is data science slide, and then another one on this types of analytics slide. Um, so um, going back to the, the what is data science slide, um, I think you sort of touched on the need for specificity and for a very narrow scope in order to achieve success. So that is, you know, don't be too broad um, when applying a data solution. You pick a specific problem you want to fix with specific parameters. So have you seen any examples of where companies have started without knowing where they're going to end and what have the outcomes been in those cases? Sure, I, uh, we see actually that's the one of the more ideal um, places to, to start. Sometimes it's very difficult to define a very specific business problem, um, and, and, but you know that there's opportunity out there. So many customers, many, many of our manufacturers will engage on just getting infrastructure in place to gather data and be able to model it and then look at possible outcomes. And, and from that, we usually identify uh, someone in the business that can provide that business problem context and definition such that you can dig in deeper and, and, and delve into the, to the uh, overall uh, information and, and overall solve the business problem with the use of analytics tools. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually okay uh, to not know where you're going before you start. Uh, because eventually there's enough information, enough data, enough opportunity to, to figure out where the right places are um, and actually find the right person in the organization who already kind of knows but can't prove it uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the thing that we look for in these type of projects. I see. So sometimes that exploratory phase is actually useful in determining where to start. It's a necessary um, precursor, it sounds like. So um, my my second follow-up question on your types of analytics slides. So um, in terms of this hierarchy you present of descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive maintenance, how far along do you think uh, most companies are? So how many have moved all the way to harvesting the fruit of prescriptive analytics? And then um, how many are still in the earlier phases of, uh, of diagnostic or even merely um, descriptive analytics? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's as I as I kind of mentioned earlier, most people have some form of descriptive analytics, and some of some of it is a uh, is gathered by hand and written on the wall, and some of it is is uh, on the KPI boards and and in the various televisions, and and perhaps it's being displayed in the in the break room or in the in the supervisor's room or whatnot. Um, and so most everyone, you know, in, in the nineties, ninety percentiles has some sort of descriptiveness. Um, as you go up the the, the food chain, it's uh, it gets it gets more and more rare, and it actually inverts uh, that it's less than ten percent have prescriptive. Uh, a, a lot of folks have a, a CMMS system that they're uh, uh, doing uh, predictive maintenance on, and they're and they're telling when the PMs should occur on the equipment. So that's a little more common. Um, it's probably not used and leveraged as much as it could be in some cases. Sometimes those things get passed over and forgotten or whatever. Um, and, and so uh, maybe not using the data as much, but, um, but I think there's an opportunity for nearly everyone to move up the food chain and get the value because we collect so much data. It's just so rich in, in the amount of data, everything from labor and cost and material and historical information and process information and so forth. 
uh, it's just a rich data set. So it's very much a growth field because there's very much still a lot of room to grow and a lot of places for many of these companies uh, to go. We haven't reached the peak yet at all. Um, it, so it's very, very akin, very akin to the space race, right? We're just scratching the surface. So I think yeah. analytics. Yep. Yeah. Um, so now I, I believe we're going to go ahead and go on to our next kind of big question here. Um, and this is how does data analytics work in operations technology specifically? Sure. Um, it, data analytics and operational technology is uh, is predicated on the fact that this whole idea around the the, the business uh, having problems is is based on everyone has three things that they're responsible for. And so there's, a, you know, John Q. Public or Jane Q. Public uh, in, in, an, in an operational manufacturing world, uh, maybe there's different roles they have. And so from a plant manager perspective, they're usually looking for figuring out how to identify accurate production costs or track, track OEE uh, or optimize scheduling. So they have a set of problems that they want to make more efficient. From an operational lead perspective, um, they're maybe curious about how to, to drive production waste reduction or, or dig into it, uh, inventory levels and make sure how to identify inconsistent operations. Um, and then last but not least, I think many of, the, of your audience here from a control engineering perspective, they, they were probably interested in how to, how to reduce energy consumption or make sure that their process loops are doing the right things or investigate why the alarms are so frequent and why there's a saturation or a lack of or, or a what of alarms. Um, and so everybody has something they're looking to solve. And the idea here is has it fit inside of a factory is that what I had mentioned before is that every factory has a boatload of data sources. And so there's databases, there's flat files, there's ERP systems, there's labor systems, there's maintenance systems, there's a ton of information. And the way that this works is that we start to tap into those resources and tap into the information that resides inside there that's really hidden uh, deeply in, in, inside of it because there's just so much volume, the human mind can't process and engage with that much volume of information. And so the first thing that we look to do here in a factory is to figure out how to get it somewhere that we that we can put it such that we're not interfering with production, that we're, we're a little bit more offline or a little bit not connected to the process because you don't want to mess up with the performance of all these data sources that you're that you're leveraging. And so in this case, a lot of times we pull it into the cloud, be that Azure or, or AWS or, or some cloud service. Um, we also uh, can, can put it on-prem as well, with the goal being to get all that information and move that over to be able to cleanse the data. And so we use a tool called Altrix, and we, we leverage that to be able to clean up the data, because you can imagine there's a lot of noise in the data. There's a lot of times when production was running, but really wasn't running <laughs> because it didn't count. There was times that it was in clean mode and it should have been in production mode. There's some times that the loop was in manual and it should have been in auto or that it was off and it wasn't receiving product. All those things are things that you want, probably want to clean up to do a true good analysis on a business problem. So we take it from the facility, we get it into a, a spot that's, uh, that, that we can modify and cleanse it. And with these tools, we leverage a lot of then IT oriented tools such as R and Python language to be able to, to do predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics and, and, more, and deeper dives into the data. So that's modeling, digging into the solution and, and trying to, to show what out, outcomes are possible and, and, and what the, the model can yield. Um, at the same time, we're also displaying that information and using a lot of off-the-shelf IT solutions such as Power BI and those kind of solutions to be able to display the data um, because a lot of factories have access to these tools already. And so we're trying to seamlessly integrate them into their overall, um, overall IT footprint. And, and the, the end goal of it is after you, you get the data and you get it to a spot that you can, can use it and you cleanse it and you do the analysis and you do the presentation is that we want to make sure that we're providing insight to people and be giving them the ideas to then go back and address the root cause. And so we repeat this process a few times um, based on the different business problems and different business uh, issues that we're addressing with the whole goal to put it in the hands of the human that they can go and address root cause. Um, someday, 
soon, hopefully, that will be a closed loop where the insight goes to the human, but also then feeds back into the factory and the factory can start to adjust the set points or the parameters to be able to uh, self-heal or self-adjust. But that's that's uh, that's soon, but not yet. I, I see. And so so uh, another follow-up question based on this material, and maybe you, you have already um, addressed some of this huh? um, in, in giving your presentation, but I'll, I'll ask anyway to see if there's maybe more we can extract here. Um, so there's a lot of talk these days about the challenges of bridging the OT IT divide. And I think when we're talking about applying data and analytics to um, OT and the plant floor level, maybe we're starting to touch on that. So um, what have you seen be some of the biggest challenges in getting OT personnel um, to successfully um, cooperate with and get the full potential benefits of a data and analytics initiative? Yeah, I, th I think it's that conversion, uh, con uh, convergence, excuse me. Um, and so, so where what we see as the many, many um, solutions can be solved if you have a definition of the problem. And so getting access to the right person in the OT world to be able to identify and define and work with us to find the problem we're solving is, is the first challenge, right? So that's just... That might not be the controls engineer. That may very well be the, the some uh, supervisor on third shift knows the most about a certain process. And getting access to that person to be able to extract their perspective, translate what that means, and put that into a business problem. That's one piece from an operational perspective that we sometimes find challenges is to get into the right person. Um, the, the next thing from an IT perspective that's a challenge there is this is I, I make a very uh, it's a very uh, little little line there and it says cloud and then it also one that says on prem. It's getting permission to access the information, get through the firewall, have a port, have an access area to be able to get the information into a spot that it can then be processed. So that's an IT OT coordination, communication, and collaboration effort. Um, and so oftentimes that's that's something that um, that takes a little bit of time. It's not they're not necessarily used to it. But the interesting thing is most people cite cybersecurity as the number one reason why that's a that's a, a challenge. What I've found is that between um, Azure and AWS and Google, they have invested a lot more money in cybersecurity than any manufacturer ever will. And so their connections, their data, the access to the data, and the way that you get it. Is oftentimes more secure than actually the systems that are inside of the, of the manufacturing facility. So, so there's so that thing's moving away. And then the last, the last piece then is okay. So now we have the information. Now we because this uh, everything from the extract the data to provide the insight is inside of the cloud, inside the analytics solution. That once you provide that insight, having people that are responsible and engaged in acting on the data is the next challenge. So it's a little bit of cultural change here in the way that, that this presents information, but it, but obviously the analytics application can't change the set point on the uh, piece of equipment or it can't modify the time that they run, run a certain SKU. It has to be something that comes out of the people. I see. So, um, and now I think we have one more section of your presentation. Um, and so if we could go ahead and go through that now, I think you're going to give us some examples some specific examples of where data and analytics um, and machine learning can be applied um, via a specific application in the OT space. Sure. Yeah, I think so. For us, we see a number of different ways to apply these tools and we're looking for ways such as um, such, such as to engage in process optimization. So the first component is process optimization. So control loop optimization, I can go into that in a little more detail. The next is we see opportunities around alarm and event analysis and management. And so we have tools around how to improve uh, the efficiency of your alarm and event uh, systems. We see operational analysis as a key way to leverage analytics to improve your efficiency of your overall operations. We also see schedule optimization as a really uh, uh, glaring need and, and opportunity. And then last but not least, uh, cost calculation, providing true cost of what it takes to make a product. 
So I'll delve into each one of those and I'll give you a little bit more background on them. Um, and so loop optimization, everybody has PID loops, control loops that, that maintain the temperature pressure or, or whatnot of their key control parameters. Um, the problem is, is they're very variable and they move around quite a bit. And there's a lot of um, uniqueness to the loops. It, it comes from the physical world as well as the software world that makes it variable. Um, and so the business problem is, how can I look at these loops inside of a facility and determine how they're performing and which ones have opportunity to get better? For us, the solution comes down to be able to analyze a whole lot and a whole um, uh, long history of PID data and then generate reports from the performance of those loops to show the operator and show this, the controls folks where there's opportunity for improvement. And, and so this comes from the data sources like your historian or other data collection systems, and they dig into this information. And so what does it look like? I mentioned a big part of this is taking and clean, collecting the data, cleaning it, performing that analysis, and then displaying the results. And so this is actually Altrix programming language that shows it's a very a function block oriented type thing. But it shows, actually, the reason I want to share it is because it shows the amount of effort put into the cleaning. You can see relative to the, to the size of the algorithms that the cleaning is more of the, of the effort. And so you have to make sure you get clean data to get good results. So garbage in, garbage out, same thing applies in every, every, every IT application. With the, the end result being um, digging into the different possible improvements that you can make. So the analytics can show you how to, if your loop's in manual too much, if your performance is hitting set point at the right amount of time, if it's degrading over time, because you have maybe three years of data, you can see if a loop is degrading in its performance. And does it function in different situations? And the way that we share this information, then the, the output is a report card. And so different, different loops have different report cards. They, they engage in these four areas of passive current degradation and performance variability. And it provides a, 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 a grade that then you can act on and see where the most severe things are and focus in on those various loops. So for the 20 different CIP circuits here that you see in this report card, it displays which ones are not performing well. Some of them are performing very well and performance wise, others are, are doing well in certain other, other categories. But the idea is, is that you don't get to see this unless you get the phone call from the operator that says, I can't understand why the loop's not running right. And so that's, that's the, the value of control optimization uh, through, through, um, through analytics. So another good example of alarm uh, of, of analytics applied inside of the OT layer is, is for the use of alarm analytics. Um, and so everybody has in, the, in their facility has uh, alarms that uh, get generated from their control system, from their process control, the way that they are manufacturing or the way they're packaging their, their product. Usually there's a problem, usually it gets alerted as an alarm. The challenge is, is it's a lot of alarms in many facilities and it almost becomes too much and overwhelming. And so the business problem that folks are going after is they, they're looking to um, identify trends in those that alarms frequency, the duration, how, how, how long those alarms are staying alive and then how they get acknowledged or not. So we're, we're trying to figure out which ones are the big hitters, which are the long hitters and then which ones don't get addressed or get addressed without any real root resolution of it. And so this is a perfect, perfect example of where there's a lot of data, it's a lot of uh, time-based data, very specific to a, a, a problem in the facility. And so the solution that can be achieved through analytics is digging into that data and coming up with a lot of uh, diagnostic information around Pareto charts, counts, and, and duration showing those different pieces <clears throat> of the puzzle and which ones are the ones that hit you the most. And so in this case, it, it's, it's shown from a, a water wastewater facility and, and the different uh, uh, chemical alarms and things that are going off, but it shows which ones are the most active, which ones are the most frequent at each location. Um, and, and, and pointing out which ones occur within five seconds of each other to see if the things are related as well. 
And so it gives you that insight that you may not have by just looking at the alarm list and then trying to figure out what came up when, or even look at the historical alarm list and seeing this long text-based string of information that you really can't filter very well. And so th this is digging into that. And again, this comes from the same database or the same his historical information that, that we got some of the information from the control loop analysis tool, which is the historian or the alarm and event data and, and, and so forth. So readily available data that often has a lot of information that is difficult to dissect is a great application for analytics to dig into. Another one is operational analysis. And so every facility has a process and sequences that they go through to the ways that they make their product. And, and oftentimes the challenge is that those individual steps may be drifting, may be changing, may, the duration might take too long, it might take less, it might not step in time. And you can see and by the analysis of the time duration, what, what's going on with, the, with, with those steps. But again, human wise, you would never notice the degradation of five, five milliseconds or five seconds. And so in this case, um, digging into a histogram of the, of the manufacturing with each the duration of each step and the, the delta between the target and the actual, doing uh, various graphs to be able to illustrate when a process is drifting. And so again, same thing, lots of information, lots of data, lots of available analysis possibilities, but typically the human, won't be able to process this information and take meaning from it. And again, same data sources, time series data from the historian. So digging into the too long in step and the delta between um, the various different phases of an operation. And then just a couple more examples. Um, this one's common in most uh, facilities as well, schedule optimization. Many times the, the production planning uh, comes down with a daily schedule, but it's not maybe the way that you would want to operate if you did it in the order that they presented it to you. Maybe there's a changeover challenge. Maybe there's an issue with uh, uh, tools or product to product in, in incompatibilities, and you want to optimize between those runs. And so by taking existing data and putting in and entering in the SKUs that you have to run today, based on looking backwards at a lot of data over time, perhaps it's NES data that you had from, from uh, the past few years, you can see how all those SKUs were run in the past, when they took the longest to change over, what's the average, what's the typical output outcome from those changeovers, and then optimize on the right, you can predict which one should be run first, second, third, and fourth, et cetera, in that day's production. So setting a little tool to be able to look back in history, understand, and then predict and prescribe. This is a pre prescriptive example of what you should do based on what happened before. And so in this case, like I said, it's from durations from the SQU, SQU information from the, the MES database. A lot of times people will have uh, ERP data as well that has similar uh, information in it, and you can glean it from that information if you don't have an MES. And then last but not least is, is cost. And so cost is a, is a big target for every manufacturer. Everybody's trying to reduce their cost. The, the problem is, is that it's difficult to calculate true production cost um, after you made changes to production because you, uh, to, to the way that you produce it. So for example, uh, you might add extra people to a line uh, to make the packaging, to make packaging more efficient. You don't typically able to capture that cost um, in, your, in your overall model. And so the, the, it often gets lost that you, you put more labor against a certain SKU. And so the solution is to take your various process areas and cumulatively track and add together the costs associated with perhaps the, the formulation area and then the oven and then the packaging. And so process area one, two, and three is a cumulative adding of those different production costs that consider things like 
your energy uses from your from your smart meters, your the raw material cost that comes out of your ERP, the labor cost that comes out of your labor management system, and tie those to your your process data such that at the end you get a total cost of the of that process across time and how that varied from time to time. So you can almost get a unit cost associated with what it took to make that product from the very beginning. And so those that, that information exists today to concatenate and consolidate and show the total cost for that, for that piece of, uh, of product. And it, it, it comes from all the disparate data that's not connected today, but you can get to it, pull from it, extract it and get meaning. So your historian, your ERP system, labor management and so forth are all the places that you can grab that information. And so those are a, a couple of, of um, examples of the ways that you can leverage data analytics and machine learning inside of an operational technology layer inside a manufacturing facility. Um, it's actually just scratching the surface. Those are five use cases that are, are very common and prevalent, but they only scratch the surface of what you could do. Yeah, and, and, and since you began by talking about the need to identify specific problems uh, when, when you begin with data and analytics, um, I think it's definitely very helpful to come kind of full circle like this and for you to actually um, wrap up the presentation by, by giving us a few example of, uh, examples of what those problems might be, what those applications uh, might be. So I'm, I'm glad that we can kind of bring it to a conclusion this way. Um, now, unless there's anything else you would like to add um, before we uh, wrap this up, I, I think we can go ahead and draw this to a close. Certainly. No, I, I, think, I think the opportunity for progressive manufacturers is there today for to leverage their data. Um, I'm sure everybody can uh, consider and understand the, total, the, the volume of information they have at their fingertips, and they all wish that they could get more out of it. Uh, and so this is the way to unlock the value of that data and take the, take those steps to get business return. But I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Sure, absolutely. And and Matt, I, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me and, of course, um, also our audience, who I do um, very much hope will um, and, and who I very much do think will garner something of, of value from this. So, so one more time, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely.